Hi, hello class. This is Professor Garcia, and as promised, I'm bringing you the um, the online lecture for critical conditions of the heart. In this online lecture, we'll go over pulmonary edema, cardiac tamponade, acute myocardial infarction, and uh, cardiogenic shock. So pulmonary edema, what is pulmonary edema? It's a condition caused by excessive fluid in the lungs. The fluid collects in numerous air sacs in the lungs, making it difficult to breathe. In pulmonary edema, the left ventricle fails to eject sufficient blood and pressure increases in the lungs as a result. The increased pressure causes fluid to leak across the pulmonary capillaries and into lung airways and tissues. So what causes it? Severe heart failure, acute MI, mitral valve disease, possibly dysrhythmias. So whenever cardiac output is compromised, um, there's, there's gonna tend to be some backup into the pulmonary system. So, and that will increase uh, pulmonary edema and pulmonary hypertension. Um, I ask here, can you see how these conditions can affect cardiac output that's causing a backup of fluid and pressure into the lungs? Uh, a lot of these conditions that we'll discuss are direct consequences of um, heart necrosis that leads to heart failure, making it an ill-efficient pump and causing some sort of backup or compromise in cardiac output. So let's take a look at this patient here. So as we can see uh, right away, right in the opening scene, look at the positioning of this patient. He's orthopnic. Um, he probably can't tolerate lying down. Uh, the nurse right away you saw was pressing on the um, his tibia to measure the, uh, the pitting edema there. Um, he has intercostal retractions noted right here, tachypnic rate. They have him on high flow too. You can't really see it because his knee is kind of covering the 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 bag here but he's on either a non-rib breather or a partial non-rib breather again a non-rib breather you'll know those little outlet discs on either side of the mask if there's one only on one side that's called a partial non-rib breather if the discs are on both sides of the mask it's a non-rib breather or a full non-rib breather and what those little discs allow is for air to escape when he breathes out but not to let atmospheric back in when he breathes in he's getting full High flow O2. No, something to note, you need at least 10 liters of oxygen to fill up that reservoir bag, and it should only be a third full. When a patient breathes in, you should be able to see it uh, deflate, and when he breathes out, you should be able to see it uh, inflate a little. Okay? If you raise the volume up a little, you can even hear how wet he sounds as he's breathing. You can, you don't even need your stethoscope. You can actually hear it. It's audible. Now they're setting him up for CPAP. Um, a patient in this condition sometimes will, um, will, will definitely be benefit from CPAP or BiPAP and deciding which one is, is at the discretion of the physician. Um, continuous positive airway pressure versus bi-level um, positive airway pressure. So it, uh, with CPAP, you have the same uh, amount of um, air for, being forced into your, um, your airway as, as much as you have to breathe out against uh, for continuous, where bi-level is, it's this uh, uh, higher amount of air 
forced into your airway, but less when you breathe out. So a lot of patients that are in these exacerbated conditions when they first come into the emergency room uh, tend to benefit from BiPAP because, first of all, when they're in that condition, they're oxygen starved. It, it's hard to even keep a regular non-rebreather mask on them because they get super agitated. This guy has probably been in this um, this condition for a while because he's in the fatigue state. He's not even at the anxiety state. He's just kind of, you know, kind of defeated at this point. Um, they're trying the CPAP and we'll see how this works out. And you just heard the physician um, talk about nitro because, you know, one of the, one of the keys is to get rid of uh, afterload. And how do we do afterload? Well, afterload is, again, the resistance that the heart has to pump against. So how can we do that? Well, we can get rid of the fluid that, um, the pressure of the fluid that the heart has to pump against um, by our, you know, by diuresing. And then of course, by using nitrous to open up those vessels. So it's not as much pressure that the heart has to work against. Here we can see a, a pulse rate, um, our heart rate of 120. Um, if we kind of look at uh, the all the complexes there, it looks like we've got P waves followed by QRS that are all marching out equally. And then we have this little, I don't know, uh, kind of little different complex here. It could be a PVC, it could be a PAC. I'd have to really um, map that out to see what it is. So, um, but a lot of these patients tend to be in uh, tach uh, tachycardia. He's definitely tachypnic at a rate of 35. Um, the O2 sat of 73 at this point, okay? 73%. Um, hypertensive at 205 over 159 in a map of 173. what they need to reduce afterload. Um, if you saw the blood pressure, we had um, 203 over 143. Uh, the map is way over the, uh, the high end of 120, normal value that they should be our 110, depending on what literature you read. And you can see at that, the difference between systolic and diastolic there is uh, what's called a widened pulse pressure. So if you take your systolic pressure and, and uh, minus the diastolic pressure, you should have no more than um, no more than 30 to 50 millimeters of mercury uh, difference. So anything less than 30 millimeters of mercury is called a um, uh, a widened. Well, okay, anything greater than 50 is a widened pull pressure, and a narrow pulse pressure is anything less than 30 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so something to think about. All of this, all of these things on, and as we get later into hemodynamic monitoring, remember that just blood pressure alone is considered hemodynamic monitoring. It's just least invasive. So when we say someone is hemodynamically stable, um, you can look at blood pressure and MAP alone and, and kind of um, make that assertion. But we obviously have more invasive and more, um, you know, uh, more sophisticated measuring devices to actually get a little more specific about hemodynamic stability.
So go ahead and watch this video on uh, at your own leisure, but it's very good um, in terms of pulmonary edema. A good illustration of what a patient looks like as they're going through this. Um, you can also have, uh, you know, this could be any scenario, heart failure exacerbation, COPD exacerbation, and respiratory is respiratory. Um, if you're oxygen starved, you know, you're going to you're going to uh, show outwardly the same way symptomatically. So it's, it's kind of a good video to watch here. So crackles and rails, remember these are adventitious breath sounds that would be accompanied with this disease process. And crackles and rails are used synonymously. And as you guys get uh, better at your lung sounds and being more confident in your lung sounds, uh, you should be, uh, be able to identify it. Again, it's, it's always important to notate, especially with disease processes like pulmonary edema, um, the level at which you hear it because uh, you know, crackles are fluid tends to pull and, it, and typically we'll hear it in the bases first. Now, the higher up, if you go to reassess your patient and the higher up you hear it, uh, it might be an exacerbating um, or it might be a situation that's exacerbating, right? Because it's actually filling up with fluid. So signs and symptoms, again, we just listened to the adventitious breath sounds that typically go with pulmonary edema, that's crackles or rails, like I said, they, they're terms that are used synonymously. You wanna document the location, as I just mentioned, because the fluid from the bases rises to higher levels in the lungs when the condition worsens. Dyspnea at rest is one of the uh, classic signs of respiratory distress, because obviously we're gonna have some dyspnea after physical activity or walking upstairs or whatever else upon exertion, but if you're at rest and you're dyspneic, then definitely something bad is going on. Disorientation, confusion, especially in older adults. And if, as we saw that patient, he just looked completely lethargic and fatigued, not necessarily disoriented, but as we've talked about in lecture in previous times, uh, the first, the main reason for uh, confusion, first and foremost, is hypoxemia or hypoxia. And then we go down the list from there, you know, um, altered blood glucose levels, uh, UTI in older patients, medications, etc. But number one is oh, you always think hypoxia. We saw that the patient was tachycardic and that's a classic sign and symptom. Um, you know, when the body's in distress like that, um, compromised perfusion most likely, he's gonna have uh, decreased urinary output. Cough with frothy pink tinge sputum PVCs or other dysrhythmias, and remember that we saw that tacky rate, and there was that suspect little complex that I said that I mentioned earlier. Um, anxiety, restlessness, or lethargy. So typically, anxiety and restlessness first, as they're oxygen starved, and they can't seem to, you know, catch their breath. And then after they're working so hard and breathing, and their heart's been racing at 120 beats per minute forever, forever long, they're going to become lethargic. So priority care of pulmonary edema. So what treatment did you see in the video? Uh, if the patient is not hypotensive, place him in high fellers. And you saw that he was fatigued at this time. So he kind of like, you know, most likely you're going to have someone that's going to be tripoding that needs to sit up that's uh, orthopnic, okay? Um, but if you put him in a high fellers with his legs down, you can decrease venous return to the heart, thus decreasing uh preload and afterload. The priority nursing action is to apply high flow O2, remember 10 to 15 liters per minute via non-rebreather to promote, to promote gas exchange and perfusion. Apply your pulse oximeter and titrate O2 just to remain above 90%. Call respiratory therapist and physician to begin continuous positive airway pressure or bilevel positive airway pressure. Nitroglycerin sublingual Q5 minutes times three to decrease afterload and preload. 
So what do you need to know about this medication in terms of nursing implications? So nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin we use for so many different uh, cardiac conditions. So we have to know the implications and what, what to do, what can it cause. We need to know our normal values for blood pressure because we don't, you know, these are potent vasodilators and you can drop somebody's blood pressure pretty quickly with these little, little pills. If they're, oh, okay. Have you established patent IV access and why? Why? Because if we're given nitroglycerin or we're given vasodilators, um, if we're trying to, um, you know, uh, decrease afterload by diuresing, we need to, we need to be able to do these uh, via IV. This patient at no point should be receiving anything via the PO access. Again, I mentioned here Lasix and Bumex, which are um, loop diuretics. You have to know all the ins and outs about them. Good to know rate of administration, of course, your onset peak and duration, so you can know when to expect a therapeutic response, as well as uh, things that you have to look out for, like autotoxic, autotoxicity with uh, Lasix if you push that too fast. That's why rate of administration is paramount when pushing IV medications. You may need ultra uh, filtration. Uh, ultra filtration is the removal of water and salts from the blood by pump. Then blood is returned to the body after those things are removed. It's kind of like a dialysis of sorts, a dumbed down dialysis, but to remove that, uh, the water and salts from the blood. Intubation um, may be needed. And I think in that video, that actually is the uh, end result of that patient's condition. And of course, have you called your RRT yet? If your patient was in that, if you came into the room and they were in that that state from the beginning, you should have called RRT immediately and then stayed with your patient, called for help. You know, when your nurse buddies come, you tell them, hey, I need a non rebreather. Um, you get them in positioning, you know, you get that non rebreather on them. You, get a, you tell them we need to call out to the doctor. RRT has a lot of standard protocols that they um, standard protocols in terms of orders that they can perform so we can get things rolling you call your respiratory therapist right away and we get them going because although he'll need an order for the CPAP or BiPAP uh, he knows the settings and is, should be pretty familiar with those settings and they can start that and obtain the order afterwards all right cardiac tamponade so we know that just like the lungs the the cardiac the heart is is surrounded by a sac um, that's con that contains a small amount of fluid that allows it, that helps it to contract and relax and keeps it from, um, it kind of protects it from the friction of the other organs that it rubs against. Um, when this, when more volume of fluid builds up in that sac, it can actually cause a tamponade or like a squeezing around the heart, not allowing it to contract and relax fully, which would obviously compromise cardiac output. So again, this is just the pressure on the heart that occurs when blood or fluid builds up in the space between the heart muscle and the outer covering sac of the heart. It happens in two ways. It's either small volumes of fluid that accumulate rapidly, or it's a, a slow, it's a, a large amount of fluid that builds up slowly okay either one is going to compromise cardiac output this is a medical emergency so how can it happen gunshot or stab wounds blunt trauma accidental perforation after cardiac catheterization punctures made during placement of central line cancer that has spread to the pericardial sac ruptured, ruptured aortic aneurysm pericarditis there's a whole slew here including heart attack kidney failure and infections that affect the heart, like pericarditis, endocarditis, etc. So what do we look for? Well, the patient is obviously going to complain of chest pain. We should see jugular vein distension. And as we've mentioned before, jugular vein distension should be assessed in a 45 degree angle. We don't want them sitting up in a high fellers and we don't def we definitely don't want them to completely supine. Uh, we're looking for paradoxal pulses which is a systolic blood pressure, 10 millimeters of mercury or more on expiration than on inspiration. And to be honest with you, this is a skill that we don't typically do as nurses, but the physicians will do. Uh, decreased heart rate, 
dyspnea and fatigue, muffled heart sounds, hypotension. In cardiac tamponade, a narrow pulse pressure is regularly observed. So again, what is a narrow pulse pressure but a, a difference between the systolic and diastolic that is less than 30 millimeters of mercury? And go ahead and watch this video when you uh, have some time just so you can see how they do the paradoxal pulse, all right, and how they can elicit that, all right, with a straw. And of course, the, the classic or gold sign of, um, of this condition, cardiac tamponade, is Beck's triad. This is hypotension, distended neck veins or jugular vein distension, and muffled heart sounds. So whenever we're listening to our, we're doing our cardiac assessment and we know our landmarks, uh, ape to man, and we're at the um, maximum point of impact, which is our, um, our uh, you know, fifth intercostal space, midclavicular, we should be able to hear the S1, S2 sound, lub dub sound pretty prominently. And if you don't, if it sounds muffled or diminished, we can uh, kind of assume that that's a muffled heart sound. And if we look over at the monitor and he's hypotensive, and then we have him in a 45 degree angle anyway, because he's dyspneic or orthopneic, and, uh, and we see that jugular vein distension, all these things should be raising red flags and then we got we got to think back to Beck's triad okay EKG changes called electrical alterns okay and that'll be that'll be shown in the next slide here and as we can see um, it's a it's a sinus rhythm here because we could see discernible P waves followed by a QRX no, QRS normal PR interval they all march out the same um, and again, R to R here, but you notice that there's one tall peaked QRS that's less than 0.12 seconds, and then another one here, but it's not the same size. It's like about a third of that size, and then a tall one again, uh, when that's third of that size, and then a tall one. This is called electrical alterns, uh, typically seen in cardiac tamponade. And here's a 12 lead EKG that shows the same thing. So what's the priority in nursing care for cardiac tamponade? Obviously, it's call to physician, call RRT stat, okay? So we got to get, um, this might even be, uh, you know, I'll just call RRT. They'll come up, assess them the same way. We'll get the ER doctor up here because they'll be in-house always. The physician may initially prescribe fluids to temporarily manage decreased cardiac output. That's while they're just setting up. That's why it's important that you're, in the meantime, in the interim that you're making sure that they have at least one eight and IV, tip, uh, preferably large bore. Uh, X-ray is being performed and echocardiogram sometimes. Um, if we can, move them to critical care, area, critical care area if possible for hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, however, a, a uh, pericardiocentesis can be done in that room, all right? Ideally, it, would, it should be done under fluoroscopic monitoring and hemodynamic monitoring to remove excess fluid and relieve pressure on that heart. We got to continue to monitor, uh, continue to monitor and uh, hemodynamically. Send the specimen to lab for cultures so we can kind of get an idea of what what was the causative agent or the root cause, because that might uh, allow us to to treat it properly and and um ensure that this isn't reoccurring because that's something that can happen as a complication. We got to closely monitor the patient for return of tamponade, support oxygen, and give fluids for temporary management of decreased cardiac output, prepare for emergency sternotomy if it happens again. So this is where I was going to have you guys do a timeout. We're going to get in our groups and I was going to have you look up because we just mentioned hemodynamic monitoring. As mentioned previously, I did tell you that Hemodynamic monitoring is as simple as a blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, and MAP. But of course, uh, for lecture purposes and when we talk about hemodynamic, hemodynamic monitoring in this course, specifically in advanced medical surgical nursing, we're talking about the more invasive, which is right arterial pressures, pul pulmonary artery pressures, and uh, pul pulmonary artery wedge pressures. So the right arterial pressure, right arterial pressure is the blood pressure in the right atrium of the heart. RAP reflects the amount of blood returning to the heart and the ability of the heart to pump the blood into the arterial system. 
Normal right arterial pressure is 1 to 8 millimeters of mercury. So an increased value uh, would indicate ventricular failure, while, while low pressure may indicate hypovolemia. And to be honest, all hemodynamic monitoring, what it essentially is doing is letting us know how effective our pump is, our heart is, uh, how exacerbated uh, heart failure is. So we can make adjustments um, and and that's essentially what it comes down to. And of course, it's it's used a lot um, to identify uh, pulmonary edema and uh, the the extent of pulmonary edema as well. Uh, so the pulmonary artery pressure and pulmonary artery wedge pressure are pop. Um, a pulmonary artery pressure monitoring system uses a sensor to measure your pulmonary artery pressure and the heart rate. Normal values are a systolic of 15 to 26 millimeters of mercury, diastolic 5 to 15. A balloon at the catheter tip is inflated, uh, catheter advances and wedges in a branch of the pulmonary artery. The catheter can sense the pressure transmitted from the left atrium, which really reflects the ventricular and diastolic pressure. The pressure measured during inflation, inflation is the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Uh, normal range is between 4 to 12 millimeters of mercury. Uh, elevated values may indicate, indicate left ventricular failure, hypervolemia, hyper mitral regurgitation, or intracardiac shunt. In other words, uh, increased pressures, right? Low levels may mean hypovolemia or afterload reduction, low level pressures. And remember that a single reading is not as important as the trend itself, okay? Um, with with uh, hemodynamic monitoring, again, with these particular things, we have to know that these are invasive procedures, so there's complications that can happen when inserting these catheters. Uh, for example, pulmonary infarction or pulmonary rupture may occur if the catheter remains in the wedge position. Air embolism is possible if the balloon is ruptured and repeat, repeated attempts are made to inflate it. Ventricular dysrhythmias may recur during insertion or the catheter tip slips back into the right ventricular ventricle and irritates the myocardium, thrombus, embolus, all of it. So that's something that we definitely have to watch out for. And of course, anytime there's um, an insertion site uh, like this, we have to think um, bleeding, we have to think infection, okay? So again, hemodynamic monitoring is an invasive system used in critical carriers to provide quantitative information about vascular capacity, blood volume, pump effectiveness, and tissue perfusion. And that's what it all boils down to is effective tissue perfusion cardiac output. Um, it'll di directly measure pressures in the heart and great vessels. Okay. So let's move on to complicated MI or complicated myocardial infarction. Uh, they're the most, it's the, the most serious acute coronary syndrome is acute myocardial infarction. What falls under that umbrella of acute coronary syndrome? Well, the uh, angina stable and otherwise. Um, well, the end spectrum of this is the, the acute MI. It occurs when myocardial tissue is abruptly and severely deprived of oxygen, leading to ischemia and death of the myocardial tissues. And as we've indicated before, there's very few organs that regenerate, that regenerate cells like, um, like our integumentary system that slough off and constantly regenerate. The heart is required to remodel when it, when it needs, um, you know, when there's overstretch or there's some sort of heart failure and other parts of the heart have to compensate by growing in size. Um, all of it leads to, uh, all of it leads to an ill-efficient pump eventually decreased cardiac output and heart failure to some degree. Patients may present with non-ST elevated MI or a non-STEMI or an N-STEMI. Typically, they'll have ST and T wave changes on a 12 lead EKG, indicating myocardial ischemia. And, and what are those? Well, it's the ST depression is one of those, the non-STEMI. So if we're looking at the isoelectric sign, uh, a line here, we see the P wave indicating atrial contraction followed by a normal QRS. And as the S comes up, the positive inflection, you see the T wave or the J, uh, the J loop here should be up here going back to the isoelectric line, but instead it starts here well below the isoelectric line. 
that is a positive, uh, uh, what's it called, um, ST depression, again, indicating ischemia, all right, ST elevation, and this is the classic, what we call tombstoning, this is ST elevated MI, again, the P wave, QRS, the first uh, negative deflection down, and then here's the R right here, and this should come all the way here down to the isoelectric line, but instead it starts to go back, uh, starts to, um, it's ventricular uh, repolarization way up here. So that lets us know it's ST elevation there, okay? So um, along with this, we got to confirm with cardiac enzymes. Uh, they might initially appear as normal, but may elevate over the next 3 to 12 hours. And what are we talking about 3 to 12 hours? We're most likely talking about troponin. There's troponin T and there's troponin I. Typically in the med surge floor or the telefloor, ER, etc., in the hospital environment, here we look at um, troponin T. It's, it's, believe it or not, the, not the most accurate in terms of cardiac enzymes. Um, the CKMB is really the most accurate. However, that doesn't elevate for hours, hours after the, uh, the injury occurs. So right away, we start looking for the troponin. But when we talk about uh, cardiac enzymes, we're talking about troponin, CKMB, and uh, globulin. Patients with ST elevated MI typically present with ST elevation on two continuous leads. They have to be on two continuous leads to be confirmed. Okay, so again, we'll see the tombstoning. If you're looking at this, this diagram here, you see tombstoning here, and we see it here, and we see it here. So that's three consecutive leads. In fact, we see it here too. So we're looking at four consecutive leads, leads of ST elevation. We only need two to confirm, so this is positive for a STEMI. So what causes a STEMI? Rupture of atherosclerotic plaque leading to thrombus at site of rupture. Again, who gets this? This is the CAD patient, coronary artery disease patient with a built-up plaque and atherosclerosis. Built up, built up, and built up. And you'll, they'll have an aneurysm. The body will try to clot it off, but then it's already occluded, so then it, it causes a, a closure or a blockage where oxygenated blood can't get to that heart. Uh, usually causes abrupt occlusion. A 100% occlusion of coronary artery is a medical emergency. The non-STEMI coronary vasospasms, usually in people with high cholesterol and hypertension with tobacco use, exposure to cold, extreme uh, emotional stress, use of illegal stimulant drugs such as amphetamines and cocaine. Cocaine is the famous one for coronary vasospasms. Um, we're looking for spontaneous dissection and sluggish blood flow from narrowed coronary arteries. So what about risk factors when it comes to MI? There's the modifiable one, which we all know, elevated serum cholesterol, cigarette smoking. We know that um, uh, besides all the, the, the chemicals and, and toxins in there, of course, it's also a potent uh, basal constrictor. constrictor hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, obesity, ex excessive alcohol, limited physical activity, and stress. These are all modifiable to some degree. The non-modifiable ones are age, gender, family history, and ethnic background. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the sternal or substernal chest pain, possibly radiating to left arm, in the uh, pain or discomfort into the jaw, back, shoulder, abdomen. Remember again that females typically present a, um, uh, with the non-classic signs, so sometimes they'll just have a pain in the shoulder or their back, uh, occurring without cause, usually in the morning. It's relieved only by opioids, especially morphine. It has a number of um, cardiac advantages over other opioids. Uh, pain that's lasting 30 minutes or more, Initially increased heart rate, electrolyte imbalances, and acidosis. Uh, look for nausea, vomiting. Look for diaphoreses, dysrhythmias, shortness of breath, and anxiety. So again, troponin T values greater than or equal to 0 0.01 are prognostic signs in patients with ischemic heart disease. And remember that they can uh, they can elevate within you know three to twelve hours from the injury. So we typically will do a troponin, CKMB, and troponin at the beginning of their visit, 
three to six hours later. And then we'll do what's called serial CK interponents, which means we'll do a series of them up to three times to see if those values are going up, staying the same, or going down. Again, CKMB is the most specific marker for MI, but it's not, it does not peak until about 24 hours after onset of pain. So, of course, uh, that can tell us a lot that we will we'll have to wait 24 hours to get that information. Normal ranges are from 3 to 5%. Uh, myoglobin is another uh, cardiac enzyme. Consider electrolyte imbalances. What diagnostic studies do we use? We use our 12-lead EKG. And of course, here's a diagram to let you know exactly where we go, where we put the, um, the leads. All right, so one, two, three, four. So the fourth uh, intercostal space, right midclavicular is the first one, that's V1. Um, and right across from that in the fourth uh, left midclavicular, I mean, not mid midclavicular, but right sternal border, left sternal border. And then we go to, um, are uh so what's that the fourth then we go to the fifth we go fifth um right mid clavicular and then we do another one uh, just next to that and of course mid axillary all on the fifth we do a limb lead either on the outside shoulders up here on the upper chest um you can even do them out here on the forearms okay uh the lower extremities you do right leg you just do on the lower right abdomen or left or abdomen or you can do it on the legs, lower legs. So uh, uh, ischemia will manifest as a T-wave inversion or ST depression, typically resolves after ischemia resolves and pain is managed. Abnormal Q wave, so we know that a Q wave, here's a Q wave, it's the first negative deflection on the QRS complex. So this has a Q wave right here. But a Q wave that's greater than, uh, or that's wider, then uh, 0.04 seconds across a suspect, as well as one that has a Q wave that's one third the size as the R wave here. So if the Q wave is like one third the size of this downwards here, and remember the Q wave goes from the first positive def negative deflection from the isoelectric line down, and then when it comes up back up to that isoelectric line, this whole thing right here is the Q wave. The R starts here at the isoelectric line, first positive inflection and then down back to the isoelectric line and then the negative from the isoelectric line down is the s wave up to that j point okay so again a wider um, q wave that's greater than 0 0.04 seconds or one in terms of height that's one third the height of the r wave are um, abnormal q waves okay chest x-ray does not diagnose mi but it rolls out other possible causes of chest pain i.e. aortic dissection. We're looking at echocardiogram, CT, coronary angiography. Um, no, diabetes mellitus and CAD patients may not present with pain as they may have developed diabetic neuropathy. The onset, the onset may be signaled by new onset of AFib. So what is our priority nursing interventions? Uh, we're going to call our RRT and our physician. Uh, they're going to come up again. They have all those uh, standardized orders. Um, we always talk about Mona, so let's talk about Mona here. Right away, we should know that if they present with those symptoms, one of the first and least invasive things that we can do is just give them supplemental to via nasal cannula. Now, uh, something to note on, on Iggy's book in uh, page 764 in the uh, 2016 publication, it states, it says, give morphine sulfate as a priority in nursing managing uh, priority in managing pain in patients having ACS. Uh, nitro sublingual Q5 minutes times three in between assess patient's pain level and vital signs, okay, because they have to remain a systolic uh, of 100 or greater to continue giving that nitro times three. Any change worse or better with the nitro warrants a new 12 lead EKG. Um, we want to give the aspirin 325 milligrams. And we definitely uh, prefer them to chew up the aspirin. It's just uh, better absorbed. It's better digested. Um, position of comfort, semi fowler's position, quiet and calm environment. Uh, again, with any change in pain scale, repeat a 12 lead EKG. So priority nursing continued. The goal of all of our interventions 
in therapies is to restore perfusion to the injured area. There's a 60 to 90 minutes for STEMI and four to six hours for non-STEMI. We used to call it the golden hour here, okay? And, and it's always, you know, a lot of times people are in denial when they start to have chest pain. They think they've overexerted themselves. They think it's indigestion, especially if it presents with substernal chest pain. <clears throat> so uh, there's always a time, uh, a delayed time by the time they say, you know, what? I better go in. So, you know, time is muscle when it comes to heart, just like later when we talk about uh, stroke and, uh, you know, time is also brain. So, um, again, it's 60 to 90 minutes for STEMI and four to six hours for the non-STEMI. So limit the extension of damage and improve left ventricular function, which ultimately it translates to good cardiac output. After the uh, sublingual times three, we can switch to the transdermal nitro, um, which we'll, we'll put on a little piece of paper and we'll tape it to their uh, left chest wall, right chest wall, left shoulder, right shoulder, whatever. Um, it can tend to give them a headache. Um, something that we have to look out for, obviously, is hypotension. Uh, beta blockers. Uh, beta blockers are the drug of choice. Why do why do you think that beta blockers are the drug of choice? Now, if you're already thinking that it's because it's going to decrease contractility and decrease heart rate, you're absolutely right. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to we want to decrease oxygen demand for the heart, right? We don't want to have to make it work harder. So one to two hours after confirmed MI, um, if the patient's hemodynamically stable, we can definitely give the beta blocker. Uh, look for side effects, and those, those will be found on page 767 on the diagram. <clears throat> we want to start thinking about unfractured heparin and a heparin drip. We always start with the loading dose, and then we give a maintenance dose, okay? We're looking for a therapeutic uh, PTT of between 50 to 70 seconds. Um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are ARMS. 48 hours after that acute coronary syndrome, if ejection fraction is equal to or less than 40% to prevent ventricular remodeling. Remember we talked about ventricular remodeling and what it does. There's pathological and physiological. So what is physiological? Physiological is like... Uh, you know, um, athletes who who work out and their heart becomes strong. It's the heart is a muscle, so it can become strong, and it you know they they might live on at a Brady rhythm that's like uh, you know high forties or the fifties with great cardiac output because the muscle is strong. The heart has remodeled to do that. Uh, where there's um, pathologic, which is um, valve problems or uh, an ill-efficient heart, right? There's been some old MI that you, the patient didn't know about and the heart just doesn't pump as well. So now it's got to increase in size to kind of accommodate or there's death of tissue and then that tissue just becomes hard and necrotic and it doesn't uh, uh, conduct any impulses or uh, depolarize, repolarize. And that's a remodeled uh, state as well, but that's a pathological remodel versus a physiological Okay, so we want to think thrombolytic therapy, so clot busting. What are what are those? That's the TPA, the tissue plasminogen activator, or the TNK tenecteplase. These are thrombi busting or dissolving agents. These are based on weight. These are a big deal. Um, so definitely, we want to make sure that we're weighing our patients daily, that we have accurate weights in, that uh, we know if they're a candidate or not based on exclusion and inclusion criteria, like certain uh, blood thinners that they're already on, if they've had it within a year, etc. cetera. Um, they're most effective when administered within six hours of the acute coronary syndrome event or within 30 minutes of ED admission. Okay, so um, look for the contraindications in the same chapter of uh, chapter 38. Um, then we're talking about percutaneous coronary interventions. They should be performed within 90 minutes of acute MI. What are we talking about? We're talking about coronary angioplasty, coronary artery bypass grafts, and stent placement. And then, of course, uh, for our, we want to look for signs that a clot has been lysed or dissolved. And again, those 
those indications are on page 768 on the diagram. So we just talked about angioplasty, or we mentioned it rather. So what is it? Um, it's also known as percutaneous coronary interventions, or PCI, balloon angioplasty and coronary artery balloon dilation. So what, is the, what does the procedure entail? It's a special tube with an attached deflated balloon. It's threaded up to the coronary arteries. The balloon is inflated to widen the blocked area where the blood flow to the heart muscle has been reduced or cut off. It of, it's often combined with the implant, uh, implantation of a stent to help prop the artery open and decrease the chance of another blockage. Uh, consider less invasive because the body is not cut open. It lasts from 30 to 30 minutes to several hours. It may require an overnight hospital stay and often does. Um, the reason for the procedure is greatly increases the blood flow through the blocked artery. It decreases chest pain. It increases ability for physical activity that has been limited by angina or ischemia. And it can also be used to open up neck and brain arteries to help prevent stroke. So we always talk about cabbage or coronary artery bypass grafts. Um, these are procedures that treat blocked heart arteries by taking arteries or veins from another part of the body called grafts and using them to reroute the blood around the clogged artery to the supply, blood flow to your heart muscle. Um, remember that this can happen naturally without this um, procedure. Sometimes what happens when you have an ill efficient pump is that uh, you'll have what's called collateral circulation, and this is when vessels start to grow around that blocked artery, okay? And that's, uh, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not a rare phenomenon at all, actually. It happens quite a bit. This is also true with uh, uh, neurons and neuroreceptors in the brain. Um, however, it's, it's more common in the heart. Uh, so back to cabbage, a patient may undergo undergo one, two, three, or more bypass grafts, depending on how many coronary arteries are narrowed, and it requires several days in the hospital. Uh, one of the most common and effective procedures to manage block, uh, blockage of blood to the heart muscle, it improves the supply of blood and oxygen to the heart, it relieves chest pain, reduces risk of heart attack, improves ability for physical activity that has been limited by angina or ischemia. And of course, we're talking at the end, you know, the end all is cardiogenic shock. So whenever cardiac, whenever cardiac output is compromised, then potential tissue perfusion is compromised. And what is shock but inadequate tissue perfusion? So cardiogenic shock is a condition which your heart suddenly can't pump enough blood to meet your body's needs. The condition is most often caused by severe heart attack. But not everyone who has a heart attack has cardiogenic shock. Uh, cardiogenic shock is rare, but it's often fatal if not treated immediately. If treated immediately, about half the people who develop the condition survive. That's a pretty high mortality rate, though, still to consider. Um, it's considered a class four. It's considered class four in the Killips classification of heart failure post MI, and we'll take a look at that Killips classification in just a second here. There's higher incidences in older patients, history of heart failure or heart attack, patients that have. Uh, Blockages in several or several of the main heart's main arteries, diabetes, heart blood pressure history, and females. So the um, the Killips classification. This is a class one, um, all the way to class four. The class one responds well to reduction in preload with IV nitrates and diuretics, uh, characterized by absent lung crackles and presence of S3 heart sound. Monitor urine output, check vital signs hourly, check serum K levels, assess increased signs and symptoms of heart failure. The class two is characterized by crackles in the lower half of the lungs, impossible S3 heart sound. We want to do diuretics to decrease preload and afterload. Nitro drips, beta blockers, positive inotropes because they're in a state of heart failure. So at this point, um, you know, the positive inotropes we definitely would definitely be cautious with in acute MI because we don't want to cause the heart to contract harder and work harder but once the dust is settled and they've been diagnosed with heart failure it's a weak pump so we want to kind of stimulate it get it get the contractility stronger and that's where we could use the dig you know um definitely want to put them in a specialty unit to measure blood pressure and, and uh, uh uh pulmonary artery wedge pressure um class three characterized by crackles halfway up the lung fields 
and frequent pulmonary edema, diuretics again, nitro drips, beta blockers, positive inotropes, uh, specialty unit again for the hemodynamic monitoring. In class four is the andal, and of course that's a cardiogenic shock. So what are the characteristics or the classic signs? Uh, you know, the classic characteristics are necrosis of more than 40% of the left ventricle, tachycardia, hypotension, blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, or 30 millimeters of mercury less than patient's baseline, urine output that's decreased in 30 mLs per hour, or 0 0.5 to 1 mLs per kilo per hour. So what are we looking for? The cold, clammy skin. Why? Because it's, um, you know, decreased peripheral circulation. Um, again, because of that, we'll have the poor peripheral pulses. The, the body feels it's in danger, so it's shunting all the blood to those central organs. We may have agitation, restlessness, and confusion because when we talk about central organs, we talk about heart and lungs. Okay, tachypnea, uh, continuing chest discomfort, that decreased urine output, and pulmonary congestion. Early detection is essential because undiagnosed cardiogenic shock has high mortality rate. And we talked about um, half of that patient population. So what do we do about it? Oxygen, supplemental, and possibly mechanical ventilation. Uh, pain relief, morphine which decreases myocardial oxygen requirements through preload and, and afterload reduction. Drug therapy, nitrates, beta blockers, antiplatelet agents, intra-aortic balloon pump. And of course, when you have some time, take a look at this little hyperlink I've inserted here about the intra-aortic balloon pump and how that works. Um, immediate reperfusion with PCI. And this is a cool little device because this is um, a quick kind of uh, temporary solution that goes in, uh, it, it sends a balloon into there with this little uh, guy wire that has like a, a suction device at the end. And then it, it cuts right through the um, the thrombus there. And then it, as it pulls back, it sucks out that, uh, that clot a little at a time. So it's kind of a cool procedure. So post procedure, what do we have to, what do we have to monitor? What do we have to do? Uh, we have to watch out for acute closure of the vessel, which will equal chest pain, uh, bleeding from insertion sites, especially since these patients receive unfractured heparin during procedure, reaction to contrast using used during angiography, hypotension, hypokalemia, and dysrhythmias, usually the ventricular dysrhythmias. So I want you to take a look at these case studies when you have a chance. Okay, so um, you'll definitely be able to pause this and then of course I have the answers here in red all right and that concludes my discussion on complications of the heart thank you so much for listening